So hello everyone and welcome to today's engineering design preparation session with Michael Bakaich. This evening, Michael will be providing guidance on how student teams can prepare and gain success in the engineering design event in Formula Student. Michael is a Formula Student alumnus himself. He spent five years on the University of Toronto Formula SAE team, where he took on roles in suspension and steering and later on as team captain in 2010. Today, Michael and his FS teammate, Nicholas, are running their own startup called Fibers, which creates fiber optic technology for industrial Internet of Things. Please join me in welcoming him to the session. Mike, you may go ahead. Thank you, Kathy. This is the agenda of things we're going to talk about today. We're going to start with topic number one, design levels. And this is an important piece that we'll dive right into. Second topic, SMART objectives, all capitalized, it's an anagram. And finally, we'll cover strategies for the design event, the in-person event that we'll have in January. And we'll leave a considerable amount of time for questions. This is the topic that I wanna speak most thoroughly on. And it resonates with me deeply. For those of you that have had the fortunate opportunity of having me as a design judge in one of the previous Formula Barat events, you'll know that I touch on these topics with my questions. This whole scheme was taught to me 12 years ago now, 2009, by an Australian formula student engineering um, participant named Jeff Pearson. And if any of you search online deep enough, you'll find the original documentation for this. Jeff proposed that for formula student competitions, there are four main levels for design. We'll start from level one, build up to level four. Level one, component design. This is the level that you all are most familiar with. This includes the detailed design of all of the components, mechanical design, calculations, free body diagram, FEA, all that kind of stuff. Choosing your suspension geometry, measuring roll center migration, all of the nuanced details that go into building the car. How do we make this thing lighter? How do we make it stiffer? What material to use? That kind of stuff. Level two is vehicle integration. And this is where the disparate components of the vehicle are connected to each other in some sort of coordinated design that creates a formula student vehicle. So we get into system design. How will our suspension interact with our differential? How does this powertrain work with our aerodynamics? How much power do we need to make the wings worthwhile? Those types of questions. This is where we connect all of the different components in level one into a fully functioning vehicle that's made for some purpose. Level three, we go one step higher, competition integration. And this is where we assess the objectives of the competition, namely to score points, and determine what type of vehicle we need to achieve that objective. We ask ourselves questions like, how do we score points? How much power do we need to actually win and excel? What kind of suspension do we need to perform well in autocross or endurance? How do we balance speed and fuel economy? And critically, how do we prepare for the race? Level four is the highest level in this schema project integration. This is where we step above the car technical aspects of the competition and talk about budget and timeline and human beings. This is often the messiest aspect of Formula Student and where many teams spend a lot of their time dealing with problems in retrospect. Everyone has to deal with budget. None of this is free. Whether you're getting sponsorship or paying for it in some other way, we have to grapple with the budget. The time is always ticking. It's the most valuable resource for any of us in Formula SE or otherwise, Formula Student or otherwise. And my final bullet point in the project level is this is a team sport and it takes a full team to win. Many teams have tried to do it with just one or two people and it doesn't work out that well. It takes multiple people to be successful in Formula Student. And that's where project integration really takes its focus. 
For the purpose of today's training session, we won't be able to cover all of these levels in detail. Based on my assessment of my engagement with the teams with the most recent virtual design event and previous four formal bar right design events, I can see that in, in general, the competitors have a firm grasp on level one component design. That was the takeaway from many of the judges for this recent virtuals design event. Teams have a firm grasp on mechanical design, free body diagrams, everything that's going into component design. These are the trees that make up the forest. And we can see clearly that the teams understand these components. I'd like to focus on level two and level three for today's session, because I feel like that's where the most gains can be made from where most of you are now to where we all want to be. Let's dive into some more details. We'll start with competition integration. We're going to go three to two instead of two to three. Competition integration is one of the most important levels because this is how you engage directly with the ultimate objective of the competition, which is to score more points than any of your competitors. That's the objective. The first place to start here is understanding the point structure. It's written clearly on the formula bar out rules. You can see which event is worth what points. You need to understand this thoroughly. The competition rules are too complex to make generalizations like more power is better or less weight is better. And for those of you that had me as a, as a design judge, you heard me challenge you when you said that you wanted to be lighter. It's not simple enough to say we need more power or we need to be lighter. And if you think about the big picture and compare your different concepts to the point structure, that's where you can start to find some justification for your different concepts. I encourage you to create a breakdown of the point structure. And that really just means writing out in a, in a table, event skid pad is worth X points, Excel is worth X points, endurance is worth X points. And then compare the different ideas you have on the high level for a vehicle with where you think you'll score points and where you won't. For example, if you use a larger engine than a competitor, you'll have more power likely, but you'll be consuming more fuel. So there's gonna be a trade-off between Excel, autocross, endurance, and fuel economy. And you can very simply, even in Excel with generalizations, provide yourself some guidance as to how your vehicle concept is going to interact with the point structure or more appropriately, what type of vehicle concept you want to achieve your points goals. Because if you say to yourself, we wanna win the competition, you can look at last year's results and perform an analysis on the cars that came in the top five and determine if we wanna go from where we are now, which is let's say 10th to first place, we need to score 200 more points. And then you can clearly look at the point structure and look for areas where you can score more points. And this is really what we challenge the teams in the design finals to explain to us. Where are you scoring points? How many points are you going to get and why? And you'll see when we move to vehicle integration, why it's so important to stress these questions. You can perform sensitivity analyses. Many of the teams have lap simulators. You don't need that. It's a fantastic tool if you're using it. However, it's not mandatory. You can perform a sensitivity analysis with a spreadsheet. You can look at the results from the last year's competition. You can make some general assumptions about the different vehicles, their mass, how much power they're likely to make. And you can perform your own analysis and say that Based on what we've seen, losing 100 kilograms is worth 10 points or losing one kilogram is worth one point. I put in, in my own point four here, a question which we've asked many of the teams during his eyes, how many points is one kilogram worth? Many of the teams were fixated on losing weight. How many points is that worth? It's hard to lose weight. Whether it's a car or a person, is it worth all the effort? 
if you look at the point spread between the top 10 teams and make some guesses on how much they weigh, how, how much is there to gain by losing 10 or 20 kilograms? That's an answer that you should provide to yourself before you dive into vehicle and component design. Because if you're spending weeks trying to shave two grams off your bell crank and it's worth no points, then it's not worth doing. My hint was that it's only worth one point. And that's because I think back to when I was in school and that's what our sensitivity analysis showed. Once you get to a certain weight, the kilograms don't matter that much because it's not the weight of your bell cranks that score points. It's finishing the race ahead of everyone else that scores points. Okay, that's the end for competition integration. The big objective here is you need to set a goal for yourself on where you wanna place, how many points you wanna score so that you have this as the high level objective guiding your vehicle and component design. All right, now let's get into a little bit more deal. We're going down from level three to two now. You'll see the progression. After you set your competition integration objectives, you can move into vehicle integration. And we progress in this order. Now that you have a competition strategy, for example, win Excel, third place in fuel efficiency, last place in, in skid pad, something like that, you can then start making decisions as to what type of car you want to have to achieve your objectives. And when you start weighing these different concepts, there will be some compromises. How do the systems complement each other? How do they compromise each other? We go back to the engine. A four-cylinder engine makes more power than a one-cylinder engine, almost always. It consumes more fuel. How is that going to complement or compromise your competition strategy? These are the answers that you need to provide yourself before you get into what engine you're going to use or what your red line is or you know, what color the paint is. These are the high level important questions you need to answer. You need to use some reasoning here to tackle these complex relationships. There's no magic involved. Simple computations can be used at this phase before anything gets too heavy to list out power versus weight ratio, amount of downforce, approximate lateral and longitudinal accelerations. These are all rough numbers at this level. We're trying to rough it out. The closer we go to component design, the more detailed it will become. In either way, you need to have some solid justification as to why the car is going to look like this. Why have wings at all? If there's no points related justification for that, then there's no reason to have it. Wings do not unequivocally make a car faster. They don't unequivocally score more points. You need to have some reason as to why. Why do you need a differential? It's not a trick question. I ask that in design. It's not a trick question. You can ask that about anything. What does a differential do for you? Why, why have that at all? Why do you have wings? Justify it in points. We'll go one more slide on the design levels and then we'll pause for questions. Here is one design path. There is no single path from a blank canvas to the end. Here's one. Step one, establish project level goals. These take into account budget, timeline, people. You need to have some measurable objectives that define what your overall success looks like. For example, Example for point number one, we're a brand new team. We realize that we can't do everything in first year. We're going to build a four year roadmap. This year, our objective is one, two, three. And by year four, we wanna win the competition by scoring at least one point more than second place. Okay. Step two, develop competition strategy. This is for your level three. Outline what resources will attribute to what events. It's okay. It's fine. Okay. Kathy's making faces at me. Point number two here is where we set our objectives for points. We want to score 300 points in endurance. We want to score 70 points in Excel, et cetera. And 
you need to make some sort of plan to say, when we arrive at the event, we're going to make sure we're first in line for skid pad and first in line for Excel, because all that matters is getting points. We don't want to risk being out of time. In autocross, we want to have driver number one go first because they're better, driver number two go second because they're worse, stuff like that. You need to write out a strategy for the competition. It's not good enough just to show up and see what happens. When you move from competition strategy, level three to level two vehicle integration, now you can start defining vehicle performance goals that help you achieve your competition strategy. This is where you can rough out the whole vehicle. We're going to have four wheels because that's required by the rules. We're going to have slick tires. There we go. We're going to have independent suspension because 0.123. We're going to have a four cylinder engine because we think we need this amount of power to work with our wings and it's going to compromise fuel economy, but it's going to score more points overall. We're going to have a differential because 123. We're not getting into that many details. However, we are laying out the full vision for the vehicle. And then step four is to move to the lowest level, level one, component design. This is where you take your overall vehicle design, split it up between your different section leaders and lead them to say, we need a differential that looks like this. It's got to transmit this amount of torque with this safety factor. It's got to be under this mass all because that's what's required by our vehicle strategy because that's what's required by our competition strategy. And that way you can disseminate these tasks to your different component leaders and they can achieve your overall goals. Then we get into execution. Step five is manufacture level one components assembled into a whole working vehicle. Step six, test the vehicle to see how it matches up to level two vehicle performance goals. The testing and measuring is the important part here. No design will survive the first contact. So you're going to build something with your level one components. You'll piece it together into a level two vehicle and you need to measure. We stated originally we wanted to make 65 horsepower. How much horsepower are we making right now? And why is it only 45? We forgot one of the pistons. Okay, put that piston back in the single cylinder engine. Now we make 65 horsepower. Very good. Test and develop. Step seven, we arrive at the event. We implement our competition strategy as previously determined and you compete. And step eight, finalize the project, document your progress and critically measure your overall success criteria. This is where you can progress year over year. Formula student is without question an iterative and somewhat cyclic process. So at the end of each activity, whether it's a test day, or whether it's the competition, or whether it's your full year, you need to write down what you've learned so that you can improve in some linear method. Okay, that's the end of design levels. I took half of the time to go over design levels because I find this the most critical aspect of the material that I wanted to deliver. We have two topics remaining and I will fit them in the final time. Let's pause now. If anyone has any questions about the design levels, well, let's dive into them. Type it into the chat or you can voice your question audibly. Question is from Rahul Sarda. Is there any point deduction for keeping high factor of safety in any domain around for uh, compromising weight? Great question about the design levels. You can answer this by looking at your competition strategy. Your vehicle design necessary to achieve your competition strategy may not necessarily require low mass. It's not simple enough to say lighter equals more points. So some components may require a factor of safety as high as four because you have not made this component before, you haven't done any physical testing, or because it's the most important part, like it's a high critical part where risk of failure is catastrophic. In that case, factor of safety of four sounds fine, especially if you haven't tested it. Something like an A-arm or turnbuckle. Having a high factor of safety for those components may be appropriate, even at the, comp at the cost of mass, because 
even if you double the weight, we're still talking about like half a kilogram. But if the A arm breaks, the whole competition's over. And you can draw on your competition strategy to answer this question. Because if your competition strategy is we must finish all of the events, then that's a hard success criteria. Then when your engineer says, I could save 10 grams if we lower the factor of safety to 1.1. However, the risk is much higher. Then you can look at your competition strategy and say, no, we didn't say anything about low mass. It can be as heavy as we want. However, we must complete all of the events. Therefore, make it as heavy as you need so that you meet the factor of safety requirement. So when you're answering this question for yourself, think first to your competition strategy. And then you can look at your vehicle performance goals. And then you can answer this detailed component design question. Okay, let's move on to the next topic. We're going to talk about SMART objectives. The theme of this year's virtual design event was asking questions about objectives. More than half of the design judges were nailing teams on objectives. We're going to go over this. It's going to sound simple. I, I ask you to trust me. This is incredibly valuable information to start using in Formula Student and otherwise. There is one of many of these uh, cliche type anagrams for objectives. We're gonna use the SMART one because it sounds fun. And this is a cool graphic I found on the internet. SMART objectives stands for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. These are all aspects that you want to engage with when setting objectives. SMART, uh, specific. When you're setting a specific objective, you need to detail enough information so that you know exactly what success looks like. This is important, not only for yourself when working alone, but it's very important when you're working in a team. You can imagine the confusion that would happen if Kathy said to me, we're doing a presentation today, that's my objective. And I brought a presentation about video games because she wasn't specific enough but I still achieved my objective. It was to deliver a presentation. So when Kathy set the, the objective for me today, she said, deliver a presentation on preparing for engineering design at the Formula Student Competition. That is specific enough so that I can use my own creativity to deliver something that looks like success. If the objective is vague, the results are gonna be vague. Be specific, measurable. Set objectives with quantifiable success criteria. You need to be able to measure them to know whether you pass or fail. So if you say we wanna lose weight in the suspension system, that's too vague. It needs to be measurable. We wanna lose at least 10 kilograms in the suspension system because I could have heard the first one, lose weight, and I could have just lost one gram and then told you success. But that's not what you wanted. So if you want, lose 10 kilograms, right. Lose 10 kilograms, not 50 kilograms, not 25, not five, 10 plus or minus one, something like that. Because there are many ways to deliver on an objective, lose 10 kilograms. You want to write something specific and measurable enough that success is what your vision requires. The A stands for attainable. We all need to dream big. There's nothing wrong with ambition. We're doing this whole competition because we like dreaming big. Dreaming big does not mean that you need to be reckless and unrealistic. So dream big in small steps. You're still getting to the moon, but you go step by step so that it's not a zero or one failure. It's hard to learn when you're failing, failing, failing with unachievable objectives. It's much easier to learn when you, when you take small steps still in the right direction. So when you're setting your objectives, think about making them attainable. Is this achievable? Is this realistic? If it's not realistic, break it down into two smaller objectives, step one and step two. At least that way you have some progress mark and you'll learn along the way. R, relevant. For formula student, everything needs to be related to points. 
The whole competition is about points. You're also learning how to be engineers, that's good. But the competition is about points. So when you're, when you're making objectives for the competition, express them in points. Put that capitalized. Final T, time-based. Set a deadline for each objective. That's clear. You're not gonna succeed if you achieve the objective two minutes late. For our competition, it happens in January. If you're only ready by February, you fail. If you're ready for endurance the day after endurance, you fail. So set time-based metrics for your objectives. If you can't achieve your objective in time, it's automatically a failure. So change it. Do something more achievable in the time you have. You can't change how much time you have. The bottom here, I gave an example that I pulled from one of the teams from our recent virtuals competition. Many of you may think it's you. Vehicle objective, low weight. You can see from this slide where that doesn't fly. It's not specific. Low weight of what? The car, the driver, the battery? Not specific. It's not measurable. Lower than what? One gram lower? Okay, that's low weight. Success? No. Attainable? Maybe it's attainable. You can easily lose one gram. Before I get in the car, I'll shave my head. There's one gram later. That's not what success looks like for you. Relevant, it's not related to points. Lower weight does not mean more points. Factor of safety question person. Lower weight could mean catastrophic failure because you lowered the weight of all of the fuses in your fuse box, which means all of them will fail, which means the car doesn't run but the weight's lower, tie in these objectives to points. Time-based, it's got no time on it. Lower weight by when? Before the competition, after the competition, tomorrow? You can see how this works. Instead, here's a different way to say it, not an objective, but just a different way to say it that matches up with our SMART objectives. Score greater than 85 points in skid pad by reducing our lap time by 25% for the 2022 event. Now you can see we're specific, skid pad. We're measurable, more than 85% of points. We're attainable, I'm making an assumption there. It's relevant because this is the exact objective, scoring points, and we have time on it. We wanna do it for this event, not next year's event or two years from now or last year's event, this event. Okay, I'm gonna flip to the next slide and we can come back to this one for more smart objectives. Next slide, picture. When you're talking about objectives, I wanted to dwell on the difference between objectives and methods because in the virtuals event, I saw this get mixed up. An objective is something that you want to achieve. We want to become first place. Add some smart layers to that. Methods are ways to achieve objectives. So the low weight objective from last slide is not a relevant objective for the competition. It doesn't matter that you're low weight. A heavier car can totally beat you in the competition, especially if you don't finish any of the races. Lowering your weight is a method to achieve your ultimate objective. So try and work that definition when you're setting your own vehicle, competition, and component objectives. Don't confuse the methods for the objectives because if you just work towards methods, you're following a vague vision. If you can lower the weight as much as you want, but if it doesn't result in more points, it's pointless. If it results in you failing endurance, it was a total waste of time. If your wings only slow you down, it's a total waste of time. So don't do it. Think about the objectives and then the methods and don't confuse the two. And this is a great scholar telling us that Tell me what you measure and I'll tell you who you are. Smart objectives need to be measurable. You can remember that one. Okay, we'll pause now, talk about objectives, and then we'll dive into our final 10 minute block where we'll speak about tips for the design event. Yeah. Um, is it good practice to write about? sensors, components in the design report that are already existing in the engine that are 
not developed or manufactured by us. Right. You're asking about components. The components are your tools to use as you want. Whether the sensor was in the engine when you bought it or if you put it in yourself, doesn't matter to me. I don't care where the sensor came from, really. I want to know what you're using it for. You can have a very extensive data acquisition system on the car, hundreds of sensors. If you're not using it for anything, then it's just making you slower. It's adding weight. It's adding complexity. It's adding money. It's adding time. So it's, so it's losing you points. So the real answer to the question is another question. What are you using this information for? Is it contributing to your competition strategy? If, the, if you tell the judge, we bought this engine, it has a water temperature sensor in it, we watch the water temperature because in our competition strategy, we need to finish all the events. If the engine is too hot, we have to stop. Okay, that's some, that's some strategy. It doesn't matter that the water temperature sensor comes with the engine, who cares about that? What's really matter is what value you're taking out of it. How does it contribute to your strategy? Next question is, we need to submit our design report on November 12th. Can we use other sensors in our car which are not mentioned in the design report after sure. we submit the report? Yeah, the design report is a progress point. The design report is not the ultimate goal. The design report, we'll get into this a little bit in the next slide. Design report is sort of the briefing material that the judges use to learn about you before the in-person event or online event. So I wouldn't stress too much about the design report perfectly reflecting the vehicle. It's, it's two months ahead of the competition. It's totally understandable. You'll continue developing the vehicle between now and then. What you should stress in your design report are your competition and vehicle strategies. Worry less about the specific components. So this is the difference between looking at the big forest and just picking off one or two trees. The judges, let's just go to the next slide. Who? Strategies for the design event. Before we get into tips, let's all remember these basic points. Some of this may seem silly, but rely on this as truth. This comes from several years of design event judging and also several years of being a competitor. The team that knows the most does not win design. The best engineers don't win design. The smartest kids do not win design. The team that wins design is the one that scores the most points. Okay, let that sink in. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It helps if you're smart, but it doesn't matter. That's not what scores you points. You score points by convincing the judges that you address all the sections of the rubric. I know that seems a little counterintuitive, but that's how it works. Remember, the judges are not technical formula student experts. In most cases, they're engineers or, or adults with technical background. They're not always formula student alumnus, alumni, nor do they have any formula student experience necessarily. They're volunteers. We ask for volunteers. So they don't know everything that you're trying to say. It's your responsibility to explain, explain your points clear enough and simple enough that the judges appreciate them. They can't read your minds. We're training them. We haven't gotten that far yet. They can't read your minds. So if you come to the end of the design event and said, the judge wasn't understanding what I was saying, it's their fault. No, it's not. If you don't explain it clear enough, they're not gonna give you the points. It's not magic. You need to take this responsibility, embrace it. There are points for you to get. They're yours to take. We look at Carol Smith's quote at the bottom for some inspiration on this slide. Knowledge and ideas tend to be a bit like experience. They're nice, but not necessarily useful. Clear thinking, logical priorities, and the ability to reason will beat bright ideas and unassisted experience every time. And that's what, how it goes for the design event. There's a rubric. You all have access to the rubric. 
the judges only give you points for stuff that's on the rubric. If you spend the entire time talking about your super cool computational fluid dynamics for your under trade, you're going to get zero because that's such a small portion of the rubric. And it's not the judge's fault because we tell them only give points for the rubric. That's how we can adjudicate all the teams fairly. So know the rubric and design your presentation around the rubric. It's got to be clear enough that a general technical person will understand your points and write down stuff in the rubric. Okay, that's my last slide. I'm right on time. Tips for the design event. Coming both as a competitor and a judge. You got to paint the big picture for us. The judges need to understand your vehicle and competition strategy. You can refer to the levels from this presentation. Kathy will send the PDF to everyone. We need to understand the big picture. If you jump straight into component design, we don't know what you're talking about. Too many teams this year jumped right into detailed component design. What's the, what's the car look like? What competition is it competing in? What races is it competing in? Why are we talking about belt cranks? Start with the big picture because these judges don't know anything about you. We've watched the video, we're watching, we're talking to you now, we've read your documents, we'll even read the design report, but these are just small fragments. You need to deliver us the big picture. Most teams get consumed with these small component design stuff, details. That's level one. That's the least important part to convey to the judges. Focus more time on vehicle and competition strategy. That's more important. I don't know why this is a good bell crank unless I know your competition strategy and your vehicle strategy. If you tell me we're going to win endurance and to win endurance, we need this bell crank then I know why the bell crank is important. But if you just say, this is the best bell crank, then I'm going to say, why? Why is it the best bell crank? I don't, I don't see points in this bell crank. Is your turnbuckle FVA so important to scoring points? You didn't mention what engine you use. One team did that just last week. You can see how comical that sounds. We need to know, as the judges, the vehicle and competition strategy, because that is what's in the rubric. And for you at trying to compel them to give you points, if you can convince them on the competition strategy, and if you can convince them on the vehicle strategy, then when you say this bell crank meets our strategy, that's why it's the best bell crank for us. Then they have no choice but to say, yes, that makes sense. Everything there was logical. I understand the strategy. I understand why the bell crank is important. Give them the points. Start with clear competition and vehicle objectives. Mention points. Mention points. Walk them through with some visual process. We got to see the car in like the first part of the video, not the last part of the video. The car is the vision. The car is the whole forest. We need to see the forest, not the trees. What's my point here about points? Right. We want to score points. Each event is worth X amount of points. Endurance requires these functional requirements. That's why we have a differential, because a differential meets functional requirement X, Y, Z. That's why we're scoring points. If you walk the judges through this logical process, they have no choice but to give you points. If it all makes sense, put the points down. It's so easy for a judge to write 20 out of 25. 23 out of 25, but I do it all the time. Just like, right, 23 out of 25, so easy. As long as they think the students made a good argument, everything was clear, I can see the vision, give them the points. We give like five out of 25 when a student just talks about bell cranks. And we say, uh, what's this car about? Is this a Baja car? Is this a boat? Is this an airplane? No one told me anything. They just told me about bell cranks. We need to see the whole vision. Last section, Q&A. Whether it's the video Q&A in the virtuals or in person, hopefully in January, 
you've got to take control over the event. This is a, this is a recommendation for life and for forming a student. You have to get after it with these points. They're yours to win. Take control over the event. Don't wait for the judges to ask you questions. Because if you let me ask you a question, I will find one that you cannot answer. Don't allow that. Present to me your vision. You know the rubric. So present to me a vision that scores points in the rubric. And I will listen politely. I will walk through the rubric. I'll say, yeah, exactly. 23 out of 25. Give them the points. It's just that easy. If you come unprepared with no presentation, I will start asking questions. And I'm not a nice judge. So I'll ask you hard questions and you won't get points. And we'll make sure that we spend 45 minutes on bell pranks so that you don't get any points in any of the other rubric, rubric sections. Make a presentation that unequivocally describes your score in each rubric category. The rubric is well laid out by Kathy. There are bullet points throughout it. Make sure you mention those keywords. Simulation, say simulation. Project management, say project management. Timeline, just make a timeline if you have to. Make sure you hit all those points. Make it easy for the judges. They're flying through teams all day. Sometimes it's in the middle of the night for the virtuals. Lead them to the rubric. Hold the pen for them. Move it around, write 20 out of 25. You can do this by compelling them with your vision. If you say, we're going to win this event, that's our goal. We need to score more than 800 points because last year, winning team scored 750 points. Okay, this is how we're going to do it. We need to score at least this, 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 this. In order to do that, we need a car that looks sort of like this and meets these functional requirements. That's why we have these tires. That's why we have independent suspension. This is our little free body diagram. If you want to know some more details, ask person number two. If you walk them through that whole process, mention all of the keywords in the different parts of the rubric, you're going to get points because the judge is going to say, this all made sense. We're going to say, did they ask, did they talk about physical testing? And the judge will say, yes, they said the words physical testing. They showed me some pictures. Okay. 20 out of 25. There you go. Last point. Less is more. This is a presentation to non-technical people. They're technical, but they're non-technical. They don't know all the details about form of the student. Appreciate that. There's nothing you can do to change it. So make your presentation to that audience. Do not read your Wikipedia entry for your form of the student car. I don't need to know all of your diameters, brake rotor diameter to the micron. I don't need to know that. I don't need to know any of those numbers. Don't say millimeter. That's way too much detail. Give us a high level vision. Walk us through your logic process. If one of the judges wants to ask about details, you're ready with details. Don't start off with that. Give us the vision. Avoid these intricate details because they soak up too much time. You're talking about brake rotor diameter. We're not talking about powertrain section strategy. I want to know about powertrain section strategy. That's worth 25 points. Brake rotor diameter, zero points in the rubric. Okay, teams, you got this recording. You have the virtuals recording. You have last year's recording. There's probably recordings all over the place. You know what the rubric is going to ask you. Practice. Don't show up to the event and that's your first time going through a design event practice. It's so easy to practice at home. You have to do what other teams are unwilling to do at home. And that will help you do what other teams can't do when you get to the competition. So practice. Have someone ask you the same questions. What's your competition strategy? What are your objectives? Why do you have wings? If you don't have good answers, make good answers. So you're ready because the judges are going to ask you that stuff. Practice the rubric. Make sure that your presentation touches on all points of the rubric. That's it. That's the last slide. Final slide. Summary roundtable. We covered design levels. There are four levels in this schema for design. Component design, level one. Most of you have that okay. Vehicle integration, level two. How do all of the components work together? Level three, competition integration. 
how does the vehicle score points? And level four, project integration. How do you organize all your team members, make sure you have enough money, and make sure you score the points before the end of the competition? Those are the design levels. Smart objectives. Follow the scheme. Specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time-based. Use those acronyms to help define SMART objectives. And remember, there's a big difference between an objective and a method. Separate them. Each objective will have many methods. Some of them are good, some of them bad, some of them will strike off. Separate the methods and objectives. Don't confuse the two. And we covered strategies for the design event. The number one takeaway is the judges are just regular people marking a rubric. There's no magic here. We do not read minds. So practice the rubric. Make a presentation that leads the judges to give you points in the rubric. Practice. OK. OK. Um, we've got a few questions. Some of them came like right when you started the session. So I'm still going to say it. And you can say you've covered it if you have. Um, for a design judge, where does a well-explained well design stand in comparison to a well-designed but poorly understood design? How much does the actual design matter or how much does working efficiently with the limitations matter? Well, I'm going to interpret it in one way. Let's say this comes up often. Let's say you have a great design for something, good, good suspension geometry, good design for suspension geometry. That team member graduates next year. The team reuses the great design for suspension geometry. The new team doesn't know anything about suspension. What you can at least do is know how that suspension works in your vehicle and competition strategy. That, that can be the first the place you start first. You know why the suspension is used. You know what it does for you. You may not know all of the details, but that's okay. We don't need to know all of the details. You don't need to know exactly how all of the components of your engine work to know that it makes you power and you need power and you need X amount of power for your competition strategy. So I would say without knowing more about the nature of your question, Look to these design levels. Try and answer the question yourself by looking to these design levels and know that detailed component design is at level one for a reason. It contributes upwards to competition strategy. All right. Um, thank you, Mike. The next question is, we are a first year team. So what points uh, should we focus on in the design report? Focus on these design levels. Have some material that talks to your project integration, competition integration, vehicle integration, component design. Use that framework if you want. It's free to use. Talk about your strategy. Focus less about detailed mechanical design. That's the least important part. Show us the vision of what you want to do. Even if you're a first year team, you can have a competition strategy. The strategy may be, we want to arrive at the competition and take pictures. Because your project integration is year one, learn. Year two, make a car that passes scrutineering. Year three, make a car that can finish Excel. Year four, win the event. That's a strategy. Tell us your strategy. It can be a multi year strategy. Show us the vision. That way, in design, when you say, we didn't design anything because we were a first year team, we give you zero. If you say, we don't have that much component design, but look at our strategy. This is how we came up with our project strategy. This is how we came up with our competition strategy. That's design. We can give you points for that. You may not get points for driver interface, but you can at least get points for project management and competition strategy. All right, our next question is, does it matter how many pages or words the design report is? I yes. mean, the pages are there, obviously. The rule book states that, how about the words? Right. Yeah, there's a limit for a reason. 
You need to be concise with the material that you're presenting to the judges. One thing to keep in mind, just like in the in-person event, these judges are just regular people and they are going to be reading like 20 design reports in preparation for the event, maybe less. So if you put dense, thick, heavy material with links that they have to click on, you're gonna be missing the boat. They're not going to look at that. In this past virtuals, we were getting like 50 pages for appendix. We did not read all of it. When you have 50 pages plus YouTube videos plus hyperlinks, we're not reading that stuff. The challenge is yours to explain to us what you think is important. So just tell us what's important for the rubric. We don't need to know the code for your microcontroller that's running the screen. We don't need to know that. I don't care about that. I don't even care that you have a screen. I want to know why the screen is there. How does that score points? How you program is your business. I don't need to know that. All right. Our next question is, how does it affect the points in the design event if we couldn't fulfill our objectives? Well, that happens all the time in life. We don't meet all of our objectives. I would say, be honest with the judges because you can learn a lot from documenting your honest progress towards objectives. If you state that last year, your smart objective was you wanted to come at, in the top five. So to do that, you needed to win skid pad, but you only came second place in skid pad. And based on your analysis, if you reduce the weight by 20 kilograms, change nothing else, you'll win skid pad, you'll come top five. There, that's, that's a great strategy. You, you will not always meet your objectives. Be honest about it and learn something from it. Use that to make new objectives. And that's how you can progress. That's the, the, the macro version of our attainable and smart objective. Baby steps towards a big goal. All right, our next question is, the electronics part of a formula car is known as the nerves of the car. Should we define each component sensor or just write the names of the components sensors? And I think he's talking about the report. Yeah, helpful in the engineering report regarding electronics is a wiring diagram. If you're gonna make a wiring diagram, remember that the judges are that are going to be looking at it are not necessarily electrical engineers. So you don't need to have a wiring schematic as you would for the technician wiring the harness. Give us a block diagram with human readable words to say, here is the breakover travel sensor, here's the battery, here's the fuse box, that kind of stuff. Diagram shows us that you have some coordinated design and your presentation will tell us why these parts are the way they are. All right. Um, our next question is, our manufactured car obviously differs in certain aspects from the design, with some parts of the vision not being realized at all. In the event, should we be defending our original design or the final car? The final car. That's, the, that's where you got to. Tell us about the final car. Acknowledge your objectives, your targets. We want to know what you set out to do, what you achieved, and why there's a difference. And if this is good or if this is bad. But talk about the car that you have there. That's the most important one. One more thing before you move on, Kathy. This one questionnaire did us all a favor by bringing up a topic that I forgot to mention. The word obviously should have no place in your engineering design presentation. And I'm not picking on this one person. I'm saying constructively as a group, don't say obviously. Nothing about this is obvious. Nothing about this is obvious. If you find yourself going to say obvious, stop and explain why it's obvious. Because if you say to the judge, obviously we wanted to lower the weight. The judge is going to say, perfect, zero. Nothing about this is obvious. There's no justification for the rubric, zero. So if you say, we want to lose weight because losing weight based on our lap simulator will gain us more points, that's a good one. Say it like that. Try not to say obvious. All right. Uh, Mike, uh, there is no questions here, but I have a question for you. Uh, we did have the virtuals recently, right? And we had um, a few teams chose to not turn on their cameras mm -hmm. uh, a few teams had a lot of like there was a lot of silence when a judge asked the question yeah 
um, can you speak on your uh, based with speaking with the other judges? What did you all feel about that, and how did that affect the scores? Did that do you think it affected the scores? Do you think it could affect the scores, or you know, prevent the teams from getting asked more questions for getting more points? I think this is, comes to the human aspect of the competition, at least virtual and in-person part. The judges are humans. The students are humans. The students typically more nervous than the judges, typically. It, it works at a detriment to you if you're nervous and there's a lot of silence. Because if you're not saying anything, the judges have nothing to mark. So if, if you spend 30 seconds saying nothing, you're not scoring points. This is somewhat of an inevitable human reaction. How you can um, combat this is through practice. Find people that make you nervous, like your teachers or your parents or your friends, and get them to ask the questions that the judges will ask you and prepare. It's like taking cold showers in the morning. You harden yourself so that you're ready to start the day. Practice with tough questions that make you nervous so that when the time comes, I'm going to ask you, tell me your objectives. If that makes you nervous, you didn't practice enough. Practice. So, uh, Mike, another question. We have a lot of first year teams this year, right? Uh, now, the disadvantage they have is that they don't have alumnus who can, you know, critique them, especially yeah. in Formula students. So, in, in terms of this practice and preparation, yeah. how do you think that they can go about, um, you know, well, everyone has the rubric, so you can get the rubric. That's, that's a good foundation to start with. In, let's say, overall competition, the objective is score points. In the design event, your objective is to score points, and to get those points, you go through the rubric. So even if you, even if you just join Formula Student right now, you can still gain access to the rubric and know what you're working towards. So that's step number one. And yeah, not everyone has years of alumni to support them. So what? Find some of your friends. Say, I need you to pretend to be a judge. Watch this video from last year and then ask me the same questions. There's something. And then when you go to competition, write down your experience, record all the events, take photos, review it when you get home. And now you have 100% more experience than you did the previous year. And put that in your project strategy. This year, we're a first year team. Our objective is to collect important information like what the judges ask about, what the competition's like, where do we buy t-shirts so that next year we can make a detailed plan. There you go. So um, for the teams over here, you must be wondering where can you find the rubric? So we are just doing a few changes, but they will be available on formulabar.com com slash downloads you go to guidelines and there will be the static scoring sheets right now you'll be able to find the business one uh the engineering design should be up within a week uh but uh, if you've been participating in this event in the past it's the same one uh where it's going to be very close to the same one that we've been using throughout the years um we've we've got a few learnings from the virtuals and from running virtuals in the last two years and we thought that we could probably integrate a few um points uh, as well in there, especially about validation, process validation and uh, testing. Um, yes, so if anyone else has any other questions, uh, you can definitely unmute and you know ask away. Um, otherwise, we'll have a few parting words, I guess. Closing statements. Teams, thank you for listening to me rant to you for an hour. I tried to keep this light on uh, detailed information. The reason I wanted to press you with the design levels and the objectives was from the last two years of Formula Broad Virtuals, I saw that as the ground where you can score the most amount of points from where you are now to where you want to be. You can make significant improvements by expressing your competition strategy and your vehicle strategy to the judges. So if you're struggling with engineering design competition right now, think about these points. They're not gospel. Consider them. If they work for you, 
there's ample room to uh, build on to make a big jump forward in the design competition. Even the teams in the design finals are struggling with objectives and competition strategy. So there is a huge opportunity for you to take advantage of this information and make a big jump in design. Teams, I'm on a mission to inspire more girls to get into STEM, particularly young girls in elementary school. And as on, on that mission, I'm a part of this video game company with two other Formula student alumni. And you can see our cool artwork here. We're making video games to inspire little girls to get into STEM. Check out our website, hit up our socials, download the game. It's a hoot of a good time. Check it out. I'll leave this slide up here for the rest of the presentation. I have one more question from Rahul. It is, as a first year team, we're nervous that we may have missed something fundamental. How common is a first year team failing in TI? I think you have to be honest with this. Technical question. inspection? Yeah. Yeah, sure. It's common. I don't know if that is a good thing or a bad thing to tell you. I, don't set your sights low. You can definitely pass technical inspection. It's a static set of requirements. So you can practice as much as you want. You have the technical inspection score sheet or checklist. Go through it honestly. If you think you're on the border, with one of the requirements, then uh, give yourself more margin because you need to be honest whether you're gonna pass or not. Teams usually fail technical inspection because they're not honest with themselves. If you don't have enough helmet clearance, if it's 1.9 inches or 47 millimeters, it's a fail. Don't come to competition thinking that you'll just scrunch down because that's not how it works. And it's the same with everything else. Go through it statically at home, practice. A lot of these recommendations are going to be about practice. Uh, all right, everyone. Thank you. You all have a wonderful evening and best wishes and good luck for your uh, engineering design report submission. Take care, everyone. See you in January.